So, remember the question. All the way back to the beginning. Tell us when will this be? What will be the sign of your coming and at the end of the age? So, he sort of dismissed all of that. And now we move to the answer. It's not this. Instead, it's this. We're moving to the, it's this. Verse 27. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Human, Son of Man. What does that mean? As far as the lightning comes from the east to the west. So, got to imagine the ancient world again when there aren't street lights everywhere. When lightning flashed, it filled the entire sky. People could see it everywhere. Nobody could go, wait, there wasn't lightning where I was. There's no idea that it didn't happen. If it happens, you know it. So will be the parousia. There'll be no question. So right now people are going, is that the Messiah returned? If you have to ask, it hasn't happened is the point here. There will be no mistaking it. Uh, Matthew has Jesus saying, wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. That's a wonderfully lovely image. But you get the point. You know if the vultures are circling, there's something dead below. There's a clear sign. There's no question, right? That's what keeps going on here. Immediately after the suffering of those days. So all that stuff that we've just been talking about after that. The sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven. And the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. All the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. More language from Daniel, by the way. With power and great glory. Okay. Is the sun still shining? Just a second. Is the sun still shining? Look out. See sun? It hasn't happened yet. Last night, did you see the full moon? Hasn't happened yet. Stars falling, hitting you on the head? It hasn't happened yet. So, what will it look like? It will be a change of the cosmos. Not just a change in the state of church. Not just a change in the nature of politics. It will be such a radical change that the laws of the universe will be reversed. So as long as that hasn't happened, quit worrying about it. At least quit worrying about the timing of it. Okay, so the question is, and I, um, we've got all these people who are saying these are the signs of it coming, Watch, you know, contemporary people looking around and saying only the faithful recognize it. But am I saying that's not the point unless you've been hit over the head with a sledgehammer where everybody knows it. It hasn't come. So, yes, that's what I'm saying Matthew is saying. But I'm saying a little bit more than that, or I was going toward a direction a little more than that, to say that part of the way Matthew is doing that is to say quit worrying about the chronology because there's something more important here at stake in this eschatology. So he... Because look at what happens just next. Um... He keeps going, uh, so I've got to work with way. Verse 32, from the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branches becomes tender, puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. Again, fig tree blooms, you know, right? Um, so also when you see these things, you know that he is near at the very gate. Now look at this verse, this next verse. Truly I tell you, this is Jesus talking. Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Somebody tell me what that means. What do you think that means? Jesus is talking to the disciples around the year 30 and says, I'm telling you, some people sitting right here will not pass away before the earth quits, before the sun quits shining, the moon quits shining, and the stars fall. So was Jesus just wrong? I seem to understand it. I mean, it seems to make, it seems to be an obvious assertion. 
See, here's, here's the interesting thing. We know this language comes from Mark, right? If you look over, it's in Mark. Matthew's writing around the year 80-ish. So let's say 50 years after Jesus' crucifixion, resurrection. Hmm? They're gone. That's exactly right. They are gone. So if you were Matthew's editor, wouldn't you say, oh, you should take this line out? Because it makes Jesus look like he's not, he doesn't know what he's talking about. But Matthew keeps it in. We, we've already seen that Matthew's a pretty subtle writer. He's a good theological thinker. So that means he wants this line in. Because he wants every generation to have the experience of we will not pass away until this happens. But it also means he's giving a, Matthew's giving us a signal that you can't be thinking of this just in literal terms. Something else has to be at play here. Because in literal terms, chronology has passed and that generation is long gone. Now some people will read this in relation to those people who rise at the crucifixion in terms of Matthew's own theology. Um, There's a sign that it starts happening. And, And that's an interesting sort of literary connection. But I think the more important thing here is that Matthew is trying to say, we got to grow up in the faith. We want to take eschatology seriously, and I'm going to offer you a new way of thinking about it. But you got to get out of your head thinking about it literally, because look what then comes next. So we get this odd line. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, which we've just heard about, by the way. But my words will not pass away, but... About that day, oh sorry, but about that day and hour, no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Okay, there's a new kind of sledgehammer. Say, I'm tired of all the speculation about when. Every time a new person pops up out in the marketplace and sounds good, we go, Messiah returned? The Son's still there, quit asking that question. So Matthew uses this part. He says it's the signs of the time will be cosmic. Now the question becomes everything that's going to follow about what to do in between. We are right here. We live between the already and the not yet. So quit worrying about timing of it and start figuring out how to live toward it. So look at this next little bitty parable metaphor that's stuck in there. Notice this is not in Mark. Matthew adds it in verse 37. For as the days of Noah... How we turn Noah into a cute little children's story, I'll never know. The cries of those people in the water, that never gets put up on the nursery wall. People drowning. We just had the rainbow. For as the days of Noah were, so will be the coming of the son of the human. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark. All right, what is that line about? What? Sorry, hurt. The present, but, but when he's talking about the days of Noah, what does it mean to say they were eating and drinking and marrying and all that thing? They were living life. They weren't worried about it. They weren't expecting it. And that's a problem, right? So he is not saying, so let's, let's not worry about eschatology, about the end with the capital. He says, listen, he wants us to quit worrying about chronology, but he's not saying we won't be surprised. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark and they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them all away. Literally, it's took away. It doesn't matter. Swept away, took away. But so too will be the coming of the son of the human. So you don't know the time. Quit worrying about it. It will come when it comes. But there's something more there. Then two will be in the field. 
One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding meal together. One will be taken and one will be left. Which of the two is saved? No. That is reading it through 1 Thessalonians, through Revelation, and through the Left Behind series, which we do. Let's go back to the Noah story. Who is saved? The one left behind in the ark or the one taken away by the water? So Matthew has set up an analogy that the end, metaphorically here, is when those who are taken away are gone and the faithful are left behind. That is a different view of the end. And I'm going to show you more. I'm going to keep arguing for it. So you may not be there with me yet, but I'm going to try and get you there. But notice, we've just assumed that two will be left in the field, one will be taken, and one will be left. But where is the one taken? In 1 Thessalonians, Paul tells us, to meet Christ in the air, right? That's his view. Here, it's just they're taken away like the flood takes you away, kills you. Not a good thing. Keep awake, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming, but understand this. All right, so now we're having a transition part of the discourse. So we've now, just remember the flow of the argument. What are the signs of your coming in the end of the age? Well, it's not these things. It's cosmic. So given that, what's it going to be like or what's existence like? And we're getting set up. Understand this, if the owner of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would have not let his house be broken into. Okay, that's just common proverb kind of knowledge, right? If you know somebody's going to break into your house, you stay up and protect it. What's the implication here? Hmm? How do you do that when he's just said you don't know when the thief is coming? You always be ready. Quit worrying about when and start worrying about yourself. Always be ready. Always be awake. So it is not about timing and chronology and history lessons. Instead, it is about a form of existence in light of the comingness of the, the, the kingdom. You must also be ready, verse 44, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. You can't wait and just get ready. You've got to always be ready. Well, it, yes. It is plural. It is plural. So, in, in the, in, you know, we've got two narrative worlds, if you wish, just to do it. So, inside the narrative, we have Jesus talking to the disciples. And then in the wider one, that is Matthew talking to the church. So, that is the you. I saw another hand. What role would you like the alarm system to play? <laughs> There's, there probably is, but I'm going to leave you to write it. Um, but there is no alarm system. I mean, in a sense, alarm, and, and here's the honest truth. Alarm's not going to do you any good once the earth quits shining anyway. If you haven't already been ready, there's no time to get ready when the, the buzzer starts going off. Um, because what we're talking about here is ethics. What he's setting up is a form of existence that he expects us to hold on to in the midst of the already not yet. Um, so look at, just look at your sheet here. Notice how we have come to the end of Mark's eschatological discourse. So Matthew now adds all these parables, these three parables that go farther than Mark did. Now, um, the kind of, of exegesis we're doing at the moment is called redaction criticism. 
uh, it, it's studying the way one uh, biblical writer edited another. Redaction, German word for editing. And, um, and so we assume if Matthew adds something, it's of special importance to Matthew. So right now we sound very similar to some of the things Mark said, except we got this Noah thing added. So we now have a, a tr turnover in our view. Who are the saved, the ones who are left behind? So the question becomes, left behind for what? I mean, what does that mean? So Paul makes explicit, when we are taken away in his view, we go to be with the Lord. Remember, Matthew says, Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us, and I will be with you always. We don't have to go anywhere to be with the Lord. Christ is with us now. So the question is, how do we live eschatologically in the moment in light of that? So we've got this whole turn. So left behind is being saved, but saved for what? So let's look at these parables. Who then is the faithful and wise slave? Notice there's no break. There's no new question. So we are continuing the discourse, the theme. Jesus, said, Who then is the faithful and wise slave whom his master has put in charge of his household to give to the other slaves their allowance of food at the proper time? Blessed is that slave whom his master will find at work when he arrives. Notice that arrival language. Clearly got the metaphor playing here. Truly, I tell you, he will put that one in charge of all his possessions. All right. The master is away. When the master comes back, some slaves are working and others, others are not. Which one will he honor? The one working. And what's he going to do for them, according to the parable? So wait, are you telling me that being left behind is salvation, and that means being given more responsibility. Now that is a twist. It is not the glory day where we sit on clouds and play our harps, and everything's nice and pretty, and we just relax forever. I used to imagine going to heaven and playing cards with my grandmother and Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> That's what I thought as a kid. I'd still like to do that. I think I could take Lincoln in a good poker game. Um, but I couldn't beat my grandmother, though. Um, but this is a whole different view. It is not that salvation means blessedness in the sense of relaxation and everything. It is salvation is when we get to the point of getting more work to do for the reign of God. So, if the wicked slave says to himself, My master is delayed, and he begins to beat his fellow slaves and eat and drinks with drunkards, the master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him, an hour he does not know. He will cut him in pieces, put him with the hypocrites, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Delightful. Matthew loves that language of weeping and gnashing of teeth. It shows up in lots of different places. Cast away. To judgment, the one left behind is the one found to be faithful and therefore saved. And what it means is to be given more responsibility. Look at the next one. The kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flask of oil out of, uh, with their lamps. So they're prepared. Prepared for a longer wait. Right, So the delay of the parousia is no excuse for unfaithfulness between the already and not yet. For unfaithfulness in the in-between of the ages. As midnight there was a shout, Look, here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No, there will not be enough for you and for us. You'd better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. Now notice the, the five wise ones aren't being selfish here. They, they can't save the others. They might share if they had enough, but they don't have enough. They only have enough for themselves. It doesn't pass on in that way. Um, 
While they went out to buy it, the bridegroom came and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet and the door was shut. Later the other bridesmaids came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, truly I tell you, I, I do not know you. Keep awake therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Those taken away, left outside, are the ones damned. Those in, left behind here who get to stay with the bridegroom here are the ones saved. For it is as if a man, we get yet another parable, going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Okay, when do you usually hear this read in worship? This parable? Yeah, stewardship sermons. I'm going to tell you what it means in a way that will make every preacher cringe from using it. And so, Why do we use it? Well, one, what is a talent? Money. A huge, no, not a day's wage. A denarius was a day's wage, which is used a lot and talked about. A talent was a huge amount of money. I mean, a massive amount of money. Um, uh, is more money than a common person would make over their whole lifetime. So we're talking about Donald Trump here as having, you know, or, or you know, um, who's, who's the Microsoft guy. That, we're talking this kind of money. Yeah, thank you, Gates. So he gives to his slaves. He entrusted to them. He doesn't give to them. He trusts his property to them. One, he gives five talents. Another two. And to a third, he gives one talent. And notice that language each according to his ability. Then he goes away. He went away. Uh, the one who received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. The same way the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and his, hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master. Now notice, first of all, how boring this parable is. The way it repeats language over, it's good ancient storytelling. Using the exact same structures over and over. It's the three little bears. You tell the first bear exactly the same way you tell the second bear. Right? Just change the detail. So the bed was too hard, the bed was too soft. Chair was too big, chair was too, you know, whatever. The porridge was too hot. It's that kind of little bit of thing. And then the third one will change significantly. So we're, we're going through the first one now. So his master said to him, verse 21, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. So what does being faithful get you? More work. The one who had two talents also came forward saying, Master, you handed me over to, to, over to me two talents. See, I've made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You've been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Faithful gets you? More work. Then the one who had received one talent came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow, gathering where you did not scatter seed. Now, who is the master? Is this a, is, does the master symbolize somebody? Who? So is God a harsh man who reaps where he doesn't sow? One of the things we often do to parables is turn them into allegories where there's a, each thing is a symbol for something. And that's just not the case usually. That's a way to tame and domesticate the parables. But the whole narrative is the story. So we don't have to imagine that this is symbolically, the, this says anything about the character of God or Jesus to get the point, Right? So we don't need to make it more than it is. So, um, Master, I knew you were a harsh man. I was afraid. I went and hid talent. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave. You knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Notice 
the master does not deny the characterization, then you ought to have invested my money with my bankers. In other words, okay, if you knew that about me, then you should have acted accordingly. You should have invested, at least invested my money with the bankers. On my return, I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him. He's taking it away from the one who was hit it in the ground. Give it to the one with ten talents. For to all those who have, more will be given and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. From those, for those who have, to those who have, more will be given. Oh, how much the prosperity gospel preachers love this line. You who have, you'll be given more. You give $300 to my ministry and 3000 will come your way. So on the, the um, TBN, there is story after story after story of people who planted a seed and receive the field, right? They tell us stories all the time as a way to con people to give them their money. But what is it really saying in here? To those who have, more will be given. What is it they have? Responsibility. And they'll be given more? Responsibility. The slave does not possess any of those talents. Just because he makes more money and it gets 10 in, in the pot he's working with and then gets the 11th does not mean he is one iota richer than he was before. He is still a slave. The master is richer, but he is not. 